Corner. Uh, hello, welcome everyone to the colloquium on analytic function spaces. Mm -hmm. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Kenneth Davidson from the University of Waterloo, who will speak on the free semi group algebras um, survey. Thank you. So, welcome everybody. Uh, so, I, I'm going to give a, uh, a survey of some older material. But, but this, uh, because of the recent uses of non commutative functions, uh, this, this material has, has, has a new life, I would say, and uh, may not be so familiar with people in the, uh, uh, in the commutative side. Okay. So, what is a, uh, Free semigroup algebra. We just start with a uh, separable Hilbert space and take n isometries with uh, pairwise orthogonal ranges. Okay. And uh, that can be determined algebraically either by saying that uh, uh, SI star SI is the identity and SI star SJ is equal to zero. Or equivalently, you can say that the sum of the ranges of the projections is less than or equal to identity because that forces them to be orthogonal. And the free semigroup algebra is the unital algebra S generated by these operators, which is closed in the weak operator topology. Okay, so um, you should think like, H infinity is a good example, okay. And uh, N equals one is different. We're mostly interested in N greater than or equal to two, but I may once every once in a while just mention N equals one to give you a comparison. Okay, so N equals one, you just have an isometry S. So the wall decomposition says that it can be decomposed as a direct sum of some multiples of the unilateral shift and a unitary operator. And this unitary operator will have a spectral measure, which is mutually absolutely equivalent to some uh, scalar measure on the circle, okay? And so if I close it up in the weak operator topology, well, you know that if, if if you have alpha greater or equal to one, then you get a copy of H infinity. And if the measure is, uh, uh, is dominates the uh, Lebesgue measure, then you also get a copy of, of H infinity. And what's left over is the singular part of the measure and you get L infinity of that. But if alpha is zero and the big measure is not dominated by mu, then you just get the L infinity algebra. And that, um, that basically is due to Wiener uh, around 1951, somewhere around there. Um, okay. We're also interested in the norm closed algebras. And uh, if you take the uh, norm closed non self adjoint algebra generated by S, then uh, if the spectrum of the unitary doesn't contain the whole circle and there's no shift part, then you just get the continuous functions on the spectrum. But as soon as you have a copy of the shift or the spectrum as the whole circle, then you get the disk algebra. And the C star algebra, if it's unitary, you get continuous functions on the spectrum. And if it's got a shift part, then you get uh, the C star algebra is unitarily equivalent to the tuplets algebra, the C star algebra, the shift, because uh, continuous functions on the circle is a quotient. So it gets absorbed. Okay. So let's look at n greater than or equal to two. So for n greater or equal to two, um, the C star algebra generated by it is one of two types. It's either the Kuntz algebra, O-N, 
and that's what happens when the sum of the ranges is equal to one, or the sum of the ranges is proper, in which case you get a C star algebra called En, which is the kuntz tuplitz algebra. Okay, so basically there's a, a old decomposition in this case due to Jebu Popescu. If we let uh, dub, uh, oops, um, I want black, I think. Okay. So if we take W equal to the range of I minus the sum of SI, SI star, then that's orthogonal to the range of all the SIs. And then when you um, hit this with S, S1, it's perpendicular to W and S2 is perpendicular to W. I'll take N equals two because uh, anything else is more complicated to draw. But then you get over here S1 squared W and S2 S1 W. We'll see this picture again in a second. S1 S2 W and S2 squared W. And these are all perpendicular. And um, where does the compact operators from? Well, this projection P, the projection onto W corresponds to a rank one. And then when you look at uh, some words in S, uh, apply it to P and then another word and you take the adjoint, then these are the matrix units. So that's where we get this copy of the compacts in there. And when you mod it out, uh, then that P goes to zero. So that means that in the quotient, the sum of the isometry ranges of isometries is one. So you get ON. Okay. All right. If you look at the non self adjoint algebra inside, you get the what's called the non commutative disk algebra. And this was first studied by J. Lu Popescu. And it doesn't matter whether you're inside O, N, or E, N, you get something that's completely isometrically isomorphic. Okay, so there's one of those. But, but there are many, many um, uh, representations. Maybe I should say. Yeah, I, I have it in my notes here, but um, if you have a, 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 a representation that's non-zero on the compacts, then it, that it's irreducible, then it's the identity representation on EN. But otherwise you have a representation of ON and ON is simple, but it's not type one. So that means that it has a very complicated representation theory if you wanna classify it up to unitary equivalence. Basically, you can't do that with any reasonable set of invariants. So there are going to be many, many of these free semigroup algebras. Okay, so the prototype is the N shift. So we start with the free semigroup on N letters. So that's just the set of all words in an alphabet with N characters. I'm just going to call them one, two up to N. And, and the empty word is the identity for this semigroup and multiplication is just concatenation. And you have a left regular representation of the semigroup. So the Fox space Fn2 is just L2 of the free semigroup and it has an orthonormal basis, the set of all vectors Cw where W are words in the free semigroup. And then the left regular representation just multiplies on the left. So in particular, we have L, which is L1, L2 up to Ln, and that's a row isometry. Um, so it, it does satisfy the fact that the ranges are pairwise orthogonal because the range of Li are the span of the C, CWs 
for W's which start with I. So they're pairwise disjoint and they all miss the, the C empty, which is often called the vacuum vector in physics literature, okay? So this gives, this is the prototype example that gets us EN and the non-commutative analytic tuplets algebra LN is generated by L1 to LN. Um, Popescu calls it FN infinity, so it's an alternative name. Okay. And so it was introduced by Popescu and later, but independently by uh, David Pitts and myself. Okay. So the norm closed algebra is AN, the C star algebra is EN, and we have this algebra LN, which is going to have lots of nice properties. It's going to truly be a better analog of a multivariable tuplets algebra than the commutative examples on, L, on H2N. Okay, so here's a picture. Um, so we start with the vacuum vector here and L, L1 maps to the left, right? It, it maps this down to the left always, right? And uh, L2 maps down to the right. Again, I'm taking N equals two because uh, uh, it just, just more points if you take bigger n. And you can see the, uh, the Fox space kind of construction because you have these level sets. Um, here you have uh, C, here you have C2, which would be CN, and here you have C2, tensor C2. And at this level, you get it's C8, so it, it is actually, you think of it as C2 tensor C2 tensor C2. And in the Fox space point of view, you think of L1 and L2 as being creation operators where you're tensoring on the left by uh, uh, a vector E1 or E2 respectively. Okay. So you can see lots of things in this picture. One, of, one thing you can see um, are invariant subspaces. So here's one, okay, generated by C1. And we will see in a minute, but that's, that's the set of all words that have a one on the right. So that is uh, the range of R1, I'll talk, in, I think on the next slide, I start talking about the right regular representation. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, we have lots of these invariant subspaces, you know, here's another one here. But just like with the unilateral shift, there are many invariant subspaces that you don't see uh, from the uh, unilateral shift picture. And the same is true here. Okay, so if I have a word V in, uh, in the free semi-group, we have LV acting on the left, but we also have these right shifts where you multiply on the right. And I'm gonna call RV the one that multiplies on the right by the word which reverses the order. So if V is equal to I2 up to IK, then V, Transpose is I K I K minus one I one. All right, so that's because the multiplication works uh, on the other side on the right, and but it's easy to see that these are unitarily equivalent, and the unitary that does the job is it just uh, flips the word the order of the word. It sends C W to uh, C W transpose, and then if you do the calculation which is easy, you see that it takes Li to Ri and takes Lv to um, Rv if Rv multiplies on the right by the transpose. Okay, so 
we can see uh, the tuplets form now that's coming out. Okay, so if we have some element A in Ln, then let's apply it to the vacuum vector, C, C empty, and we will get some vector in Fm2. Okay, but what does it do to another basis vector, CRV? Well, that's just multiplying on the right by V and then applying A, but these two commute. So I can then replace A C empty by this expression that I have here. And then I multiply on the right by V. So that's how tuplets matrices act. Okay, so um, it means that we have a Fourier type series where A is given by a Fourier series AWLW. It looks like it's summing up multiplications of AW times multiplication on the left by W, but just like just like in the, in the case on H2, this series doesn't converge. But it does converge, for instance, if you use Cesaro means or, Fayer, or the, the Abel means. I mean, all, all those convergence work the same, and it's the same proof. Okay. And I'll point out that, in fact, the commutant of Ln is Rn. It's not just contained in the commutant. Now, this is sort of uh, analogous to what happens with uh, the left right representation of a group. Okay, so what about some other examples of free semi group algebra? So, like, I'm giving you, going to give you two uh, simple examples. So, I'm going to start here with uh, some vector C0, and I'm going to decide. That L that S one S one is going to map C zero to itself, and S two is going to map it to another vector, and that vector uh, I'll do it in blue is going to be the vacuum vector, and up from that we're going to sweep out a. a a copy of the left right representation. So what we have here is a, a representation of Kunt's type because um, the C, C0 is in the range and C empty is in the range. And then all of these others are in the ranges, range just like they were before. So the sum of the ranges, um, so S1, S1, star plus s2 s2 star is equal to the identity so it's quince type and what does the algebra look like well when you restrict it to this invariant subspace it's obvious that that looks like ln okay but what happens up here well it's not too hard to see that uh, oh i didn't want to do that that if you take S1 to the end, what happens? Well, it maps C0 to itself repeatedly, but every other vector is mapped off to infinity. So it's going weakly to zero. So this is converging uh, the weak operator of topology to this projection onto C0. So if I, if I do this decomposition with C0 direct sum this copy of uh, F2, then um, I, in the upper left hand corner, I get all the scalars, and then I can map them to by words in the SVs to all to, to a dense set of vectors on the left. So when I close it up, my algebra looks like this. I've got a two by two triangular form. Okay. So the second example is what I call an infinite tail example. 
Uh, so you start with a vector C0, and then you have a way of going backwards to infinity, just some word. Um, so it's going to be uh, uh, x minus 1, x minus 2, x minus 3, dot, dot, dot. I'll call that x. And that tells me, uh, so what's going to map from si minus c minus 1 down to c0 and from xc minus 2 to xc1. I just use, I just use these, uh, sorry, these entries, okay. And that gets me a Kuntz representation, again, because you can see that every basis vector in this picture is in the range. But what happens at these vectors, if, I, if I'm mapping, say, from C minus 1 to C0 with, with uh, S1, then S2 up to Sn have to map out to other vectors, and I'm going to make them all pairwise orthogonal and be the generator of a copy of Fn2. So again, my picture, I only have n equals two. So you, you come off to a vector here and it sweeps out a copy of the left record representation. And here it's another one over here and another one over here, et cetera. So if I, if I cut down, if I cut down to, a subspace like that, then the restriction just looks like Fn or Ln. Same thing here. Oh, excuse me. Same thing here, same thing here. And you can think of this algebra as being an inductive limit of what happens with its restriction to each of these spaces. And you can, it's not too hard to see that this algebra turns out to be completely isometrically isomorphic to Ln, but not unitarily equivalent. Okay, because it's Quint's type. Okay. And uh, just as an aside, this will be irreducible if and only if this word is not eventually periodic. Okay. All right, so I, I did mention this briefly in the past. I guess I forgot that this was coming up, but Popescu's wold decomposition just takes this space, which is the orthogonal complement of the range of the SIs. Maybe now if I repeat the picture, it'll make more sense. So here's W and these S1, W, and S2, W are perpendicular to it because W is perpendicular to the range of everything, and they're perpendicular to each other because they have orthogonal ranges. And then you just can do a simple algebraic argument. You see that all of these spaces that you get. So we call this a wandering subspace, okay? Because it's spreading out. Now, if I choose an orthonormal basis for that space, then it'll send that to orthonormal basis in each one. And you see that you'll get uh, D copies of the left regular representation L, okay, uh, D might well be infinity, okay. And then when I uh, look at the rest, this is, um, well, if you look at what it does to W and then you take the orthogonal complement, then the restriction here will be Quince type because the range is on to, okay. So it's another word, and this has, uh, if you look back at, if you know C-star algebras, if you look back at representations of EN, 
then they decompose into a direct sum of a representation that's non-zero on the compacts and a representation that's zero on the compacts. And if it's non-zero on compacts, then it's a multiple of the identity representation. So you get EN there. So you get the left regular representation. And if it's zero on the compacts, then it's a representation of all that. Okay. All right. Another basic theorem that we want is the uh, Fraser Bunce Popescu dilation. If you start with a row contraction, then you can dilate it to a row isometry. So Fraso did it for n equals two. Bunce gave a very slick proof for n finite, and Jalu did n equals infinity. And he also proved uniqueness, but it, but the proof basically is the proof of the dilation of a single contraction to an isometry due to Nage, and it's the same proof. You just uh, you just dilate it, and then you split split off your two. So you have these isometries with pairwise orthogonal ranges living on a bigger space. Okay, so if A is less than one, then just like in the uh, one case, this isometry that you get is some multiple of the shift. Uh, if the A's were matrices of size K by K, then this D will be less than or equal to K. In general, it could be infinity. And then you have Popescu's functional calculus. I'm gonna write an element of ln as F to make you think that it's a function now. And how do you evaluate it at A? Well, you know how to evaluate it at L, it's just so, uh, L to the D, it's just some multiple of F to the D, and then you compress it to that upper corner. So in modern language, this says that this F is a bounded NC function on the N ball, which is the union of all um, K, uh, N row, row contractions of K by K matrices of length size N, uh, which have norm less than one. Right, so these are these balls. And so this gives, this is where that functional calculus comes from. It's one direction of the equivalence. And if the K by K matrices are, are have the sum of AI, AI star equals one, then it's not too hard to see that S is a representation of the Kunz algebra. And these, uh, these were called finitely correlated representations by Bradley and Jorgensen, who used them to generate wavelets and things like that. And I'm not gonna really say anything about it, but they were classified by uh, myself, uh, David Cribbs and Miran Spiegel. Whoops. went to sleep on me. He was, anyway, he must have touched something bad. Okay, so invariant subspaces. So there's a Burling theorem for this algebra. So just remember that if we take um, the unilateral shift, then we have this algebra, um, I guess I should have called it L1. Uh, it's just the Tuplitz algebra, and the Tuplitz algebra is its own commuton, which is an important thing. And what Berling proved is that every invariant subspace is cyclic, and the cyclic invariant subspaces are just the ranges of the isometries. So those the, the isometries in the Tuplitz algebra are the, are the multiplication by inner functions, and the ranges of those isometries are the invariant subspaces. Now what happens in a non-commutative setting is if you have something that commutes with LN, then its range is invariant for LN. Okay, so 
the theorem, which was proven by Arias and Popescu and rediscovered by David Pitts and myself, is that first of all, every invariant subspace is the orthogonal Dirac sum of cyclic invariant subspaces. And the cyclic invariant subspaces are the ranges of isometries in R. In particular, you get that Ln is reflexive algebra. It's determined by its invariant subspaces. And you also get an inner outer factorization. So I thought I would go through that argument. So start with A in Ln and look at the closure of its range. So that's invariant for Rn. Remember Rn is unitarily equivalent to Ln. So anything I can say about Ln is true about Rn. And it's got a cyclic vector. The image of the vacuum vector is cyclic. So therefore, there's an isometry in Rn commutant, which is Ln. So that's what we call an inner function whose range is m. And therefore, you can factor A is equal to Sb, where B is equal to S star A. But why should S star A belong to Ln? Well. You do a calculation and you see it compute, commutes with Rn and therefore it's equal to Ln. So this B has dense range, so that's what we call an outer function. So you, um, in more recent times, um, you have uh, the results of uh, Jury, Mar Martin and Shamovich where they uh, figured out what Blaschke factors should be and what singular inner things should be, okay? Uh, that's a story for another day, but um, the, just there's new stuff happening on this. All right, now let's look for eigenvalues. Well, shifts don't have eigenvalues, but backward shifts do. And if you take any point in the open ball, Cn, okay, then you can write down the following vector. And then you can check that these are joint eigenvectors for the adjoints, okay? And those are the only ones. Okay. And it gives a couple things come out of this. One is that uh, you can write down a function a hat on the ball, or you just evaluate this phi lambda, which is this functional that sends A to A nu lambda nu lambda. Since nu lambda is an eigenvalue for A, if you take, um, if you take A to the other side, you get an A star and you will get it as an eigenvalue. So you'll get a scalar coming out. And this is a contractive homomorphism into bounded analytic functions, but it's an onto. Okay. So let's come. So these are exactly the weak operator topology continuous characters, but they don't span the whole space. What these span is the symmetric Fox space, and that's Drury Arvison space. Okay. And if you take the intersection of the kernels, what you get is the weak star closure of the commutator ideal. Okay, so I'm gonna call that C. And if, when you take the quotient by C, that's completely isometrically isomorphic to the multipliers on Drury Arvison space. So this is one route to getting results about Drury Arvison space and uh, certainly, I've uh, used that multiple times, but uh, Jury and, and Martin have used that a fair number of times. And it's, uh, it's Drury, as, as Michael pointed out in his series, there are many different ways into um, Drury Arvison space, and this is a useful one. Okay. Automorphisms. Well, if I have an automorphism, then I can look at what happens to the um, generators and I can value and 
I could evaluate that at lambda. And it turns out that that's holomorphic map from the ball into itself, which is homomorphism. And therefore, it's an invertible holomorphic map from the ball to itself. In other words, it's a conformal automorphism. I'm going to call the set of conformal automorphisms ought bn. Okay. And um, something we discovered after we had rediscovered it ourselves by a much more clunky way, we found that the Voigt-Lescu had already um, constructed a bunch of automorphisms of O-N, which were actually automorphisms of E-N. So, but he doesn't call it uh, the conformal automorphisms of the ball. He looks at a certain Lie group called uh, UN1. And this uh, contains a center, which is the circle. And that is ought bn. But his map is, uh, is trivial on the on the uh, on the scalars, takes that to the identity operator or a scalar multiple of the identity. Anyway, he he can he constructs a bunch of automorphisms of En, but then he also notes that they map the analytic part to itself. And that's what gives us automorphisms of Alan. So we get certain unitarily implemented um, automorphisms of Alan, and they're completely isometric and weak operator topology continuous and maps is surjective onto the ball. All right, and so here's the theorem that I can to myself that every automorphism is both norm continuous and weak operator topology continuous. And we have this surjective map here. So we, we gave this name quasi-inner to the kernel and the sequence splits by Voigt-Lescu's map. But we still don't know whether there are any non-trivial quasi-inner automorphisms. It's an interesting open question. I don't have any idea actually. All right, so I wanna talk a bit more about the structure of these algebras. So I'm, I'm going to associate a free semigroup to a corresponding representation of EN, okay? And it's gonna send the generators S1 to SN to capital S1 to capital SN. And I'm gonna call that free semigroup S sub sigma. And the von Neumann algebra generates W sub sigma. So in particular, if you have the left regular representation lambda, then S lambda is LN. And I'm gonna say that sigma is type L or analytic if this is isomorphic. And here I just mean algebraically isomorphic, but it turns out that that implies completely isometrically isomorphic and weak star homeomorphic, okay? We say it's von Neumann type if the non-self-adjoint weakly closed algebra is actually self-adjoint. And we call it dilation type if it doesn't contain any of the other two. Uh, in that case, it contains uh, a co-invariant cyclic subspace V such that restriction of S is completely non-isometric. And one of the useful tools in studying this is to look at the weakly closed ideal generated by S1 to Sn without throwing the identity in, okay? So it's a weak operator closed ideal and it's co-dimension one or it's everything. And it's a von Neumann algebra, if and only if um, S zero is everything. But in general, I can take the intersection of the powers of that ideal. And that, if you look at what happens in Ln, that shoves things off to infinity because S0 to the K, or Ln0 to the K, 
is the set of words that start with words of length k and, and larger. So this is an important ideal. And it's not too hard to check that it's an ideal of the von Neumann algebra. So it, there's a projection in S so that J is equal to WP. And then you get the following structure theorem that so this I mentioned already, type L algebras are completely isometrically isomorphic and weak star homeomorphic to LN. And this, the range of this projection P is co-invariant. And if it's not the identity, then this corner is type L. And what you have here is that ideal, that's WP. Um, it's an ideal of the von Neumann algebra. So it's, it's, it's quite a nice structure. And we, we saw this first when we did the finite dimensional case uh, with uh, Cribs and Spiegel, but we didn't realize at that time that this was uh, a general phenomenon. All right. But one question we, I, I didn't know, and I asked this at a conference when Charles Reed was present, can you get a von Neumann algebra? Yes, you can, he said. And he's got a very clever construction. And uh, you, can, you basically take one of the standard representations of the Kunz algebra on L201, you just map onto the first half, L20 half and L201, but then you multiply by a very cleverly chosen function which takes values plus and minus one that encodes a certain sequence. And he said that, well, he'd used that idea before. So uh, he thought it might work and it did, uh, but no progress has been made on which von Neumann algebras can be free semigroup algebras. Mm -hmm. All you know is that it has to be infinite because the Kunz algebra is infinite and it has to be injective because the Kunz algebra is nuclear. Uh, so if you're looking for factors, you know, there's a nice list of them. And, but anyway, uh, I don't know anybody who knows enough about free semigroup algebras and about von Neumann algebras to have taken this on. Okay, so now we're getting into um, finer structure. So we, we saw in uh, Raphael's talk, he mentioned that you know, if you take the, uh, the dual of the disk algebra, it splits into the pre-dual of H infinity and the singular measures. And you can find in Rudin's book that um, the dual of the ball algebra splits into the pre-dual of H infinity, which are called Hankin functionals, mm. Hankin functionals, and these which are totally singular. And it's an L1 direct sum. Anyway, it, um, I wasn't so familiar with this at the time, but eventually I, I landed on a good definition for absolutely continuous. And that's that if it corresponds to an element of the pre-dual of LN. Okay, so a functional on the non-commutative disk algebra is absolutely continuous mm. if, it's, if it's in the pre-dual of LN. And every uh, weak star continuous linear functional on LN in fact is given by a single pair of vectors. You don't have to use a trace class, okay? And so a representation sigma will be absolutely continuous if every vector gives rise to an absolutely continuous linear functional, okay? So the vector is absolutely continuous if that's absolutely mm -hmm. continuous and S is absolutely continuous if every vector is. And I've already defined wandering vectors, okay? So you get the following theorem due to myself, Lee, and Pitts with a bit of cleanup by Dilly and Yang and myself, uh, but it didn't, it didn't answer the whole question. Uh, it's a big gap, but it's absolutely continuous is the same as saying, if you take a direct sum with uh, mm -hmm. the left regular representation or you take infinite direct sum of copies of it, these are type L. Mm -hmm. 
if it's type L, then there's some finite ampliation which gets you wandering vectors. Okay, that just comes from looking at that, that functional phi zero. And if it's absolutely continuous and has a wandering vector, then it's type L and the, the wandering vector span. But we couldn't answer, are, they, are there wandering vectors? We couldn't answer even simpler questions like, if, if it's type L, is the weak star closure of algebra S1 to Sn all the same? Is it also type L? Or could it be a von Neumann algebra? We couldn't answer those simple questions, but Matt Kennedy did in his PhD thesis. He actually has two papers, but I, I'm giving you the, uh, uh, the uh, final answer. Every absolutely continuous free semigroup algebra has a wandering vector, and therefore it's type L or analytic and spanned by its wandering vectors. That was very hard to do. And his idea was to modify the dual algebra techniques of Brown, Chevrolet, Piercy, Mercovici, Foyash, et cetera, that were used mm -hmm. to find invariant subspaces for contractions whose spectrum is in a certain sense thick in the circle, thick in the disk. And ultimately just that the spectrum contains the unit circle. Um, so we look at this function phi zero, which maps S onto S mod S zero. Uh, in the non von Neumann case, that's C and it's weak star continuous. What we want to do is find vectors. So that's a vector functional. And that's exactly the kind of thing that these pre-dual techniques did in the commutative case. Anyway, that would show that this eta is perpendicular to S zero uh, zeta. And so any vector in that orthogonal difference is wandering. And I'm really sweeping under the rug uh, a really complicated argument. And uh, Matt gets the uh, corollary, what he calls the um, Lebeg von Neumann wold decomposition. If you have a row isometry, then it decomposes into its type L part, its Kuntz analytic part, its von Neumann algebra part, and the dilation type part. And that these parts are not affected by taking a direct sum with anything else. Okay, that's the important, important part of that. Okay, so I'm running low on time, but let me, I wanted to say something about hyperreflexivity. So it's reflexive, that means that uh, uh, if you look at any operator in B of H and compute P per TP for some. Uh, invariant subspace, then that's the same as P per T minus A P. And therefore that this is less than the inf of T minus A, which is the distance from T to, to your algebra. Okay. And so that means that when I take the supremum over all invariant subspaces of this quantity, that's less than the distance. And it's hyperreflexive if it's comp if it's comparable to the difference. Um, so back in the eight, mid '80s, I proved that the analytic tuplets algebra is hyperreflexive with constant at most 19. It's now known that that's 12 or 13, but the proof had no new ideas. It just did it more carefully. Um, so here are a bunch of results that happened over time. So David Pitts and I showed that it was hyperreflexive constant at most 51. This is just LN. And we did that because we remember that picture, it has lots of invariant subspaces. In particular, you can find countably many pairwise orthogonal invariant subspaces. And that was really the key. But Hari Berkovici using these pre-dual techniques said that was a ridiculous number and he got three, which is pretty impressive. And then we showed that if you have 
uh, analytic and it has a wandering vector, then you get C less than or equal to 59. But Kennedy, of course, he showed that every analytic free semigroup algebra does have a wandering vector, but he modified Hari's techniques. He, it didn't apply directly, and he also gets C less than or equal to three. And then he, together with Adam Fuller, showed that every free semigroup algebra is hyperreflexive with constant most six. Okay. I was going to say something about singular functions. Uh, but I, I won't really, but it, it does come down to this question, can you, do you get a nice decomposition between the absolutely continuous functionals and singular functionals? So singular, you call it singular if you restrict it to A0 to the N to the K, that its norm doesn't go down. And it has unique compu uh, computation, but you get this annoying square root two, which can't go away. Um, and so that that's, that's uh, inhibits, uh, you can pass to the quotients, but you get this annoying square root two. And we know that for uh, these commutative quotients from work of Raphael and myself and Michael Hartz and myself, uh, you get an L1 decomposition there. So. But let me just point out there's an F and M Reese theorem that if one of the, a functional on LN annihilates some weakly closed mm -hmm. ideal, then the absolutely continuous part and the singular part both annihilate the ideal. And that's uh, you know, a very important classical result. And so finally, let me just say that uh, for rec in recent developments, you, you remember Michael Jury's talks from last week, you can think of this Fox space as these NC functions on the ball. Mm. Um, he, he, he did mention this result of Ball, Marx, and Vinnikoff that says that this is a non commutative reproducing kernel Hilbert space on the ball. And then you can show that the multiplier algebra is actually LN. It's done by J. Lu, and then more recently, independently, I think, by uh, Solomon, Shalit, and Shamovich. Uh, there's a, uh, a Fatu's theorem. There's Alexandrov Clark theory. This is a result that was mentioned by Michael yesterday that you can get results in the commutative setting where the only known proof goes through the non commutative setting. And I mentioned this earlier that Jury Martin Shamovich, which is fits factors into Blaschke and singular factors. And so I better wrap it up. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, now, questions, remarks? So if you have a question, then please just go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any questions. So let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you. thank you, Ken. This was a great.